Berlin became the center of Russian immigration because of how cheap it was to live there. They tried to get jobs as taxi drivers, private juices, bakers and salespeople. Between 1918 and 1924, more books were published here than in Moscow and Petrograd. The bastard came from the Tolstoy family. Account, landowner and bourgeois squared, he is now published by Gossesdat. So-called good Russians quarrel with other good Russians. Nothing new. More than 30 countries agreed to acknowledge this document. They either rented some tiny rooms on the outskirts of town or chose to stay in villages near Prague. So people were sitting in Prager deal and drinking cognac. What mood were they in? It was usually terrible. Nabokov lived in Hull and see Berlin for 15 years. As they say on the internet, he hated it the whole time. The Russian immigrants who moved to Berlin were in an environment that was strongly pro-communist and pro-Soviet. The Bolsheviks themselves established a white underground movement that would go down in history as the trust organization. We lived peeking out over the sheets. A Czechist asked Shklovsky how he felt about his life there. As legend has it, Shklovsky answered, it's like being a living fox in a furrier shop. When Hitler rose to power, what was happening with the Russian emigrants at the time? guys, this is the second episode of our mini-series which explores the white emigres of the first wave. If you haven't seen the first episode, click here and make sure to watch it in order to keep up with the storylines. It's only natural that these storylines are taking us here to Berlin, a city that is once again becoming the center of the latest Russian immigration wave. Yet a hundred years ago, it acquired such a status for a reason one would deem inapplicable to Berlin today. It was one of the cheapest and most accessible European cities. I'm going to elaborate on that later. There was one more reason as to why Berlin was favored among the emigrants. In the beginning of the 20th century, Europe was the railway continent. Commercial aviation didn't exist, or to be more precise, it did, but it wasn't as developed as it is today. No airports or flights to speak of. Berlin was home to the biggest railway hub, and that's why the vast majority of the first wave of emigrants were leaving for Europe arrived at the Berlin Ostbahnhof. Many would stay here for a long time. Just to give you an idea, 755,000 Russian emigrants were registered in Europe throughout the 20s, and those were just the ones in the official register. By various estimates, two to three hundred thousand lived in Berlin. Again, to put it into perspective, the population of the city at that time was about four million people. It was impossible to walk through Berlin or spend the day out and about and not hear any Russian. It was even more surprising because it hadn't even been ten years since Russia and Germany had fought each other in World War I. Germany had lost the war and was at a low ebb. It wasn't easy to revive production in the country, and inflation was very high. Everyone was in a state of bewilderment. Society was traumatized. To be fair, Berlin can feel very inhospitable in terms of weather. We're filming this in late March and it's very cold here, so you'll have to excuse the hat. Remember I said that Berlin turned into the center of white immigration primarily because of the cheap cost of living. So how did it happen? Because after the First World War, the German Empire fell. In 1918, as a result of the November Revolution, a new constituent National Assembly was elected. 
At one of its conventions held in Weimar in August, a constitution was adopted to mark the creation of a new democratic republic called the Weimar Republic. Among other things, the Weimar Republic had to make reparations in the aftermath of Germany's defeat in World War I. The economic situation was very difficult, even without those reparations. The country was suffering through a crisis. Public opinion was low with steep inflation and the Deutschmark in a freefall. That's why wealthy immigrants, or wealthy foreigners in general, felt very comfortable in Germany. You know, it was much like the 90s Russia. Back then, you could go on a spree with just a hundred dollars. But it's important to note that there weren't many wealthy people among the Russian immigrants. Even those who had millions in Russia couldn't get them transferred outside the country. They only took what they could. Some were luckier than others and would smuggle in some family jewels or gold, while the rest would arrive in what they had been wearing with a tiny suitcase. So the majority of Russian immigrants lived either in poverty or very close to it. They didn't get to be picky about jobs. Wrangle's soldiers, as Wrangel himself put it, traded in their rifles for shovels, their shashkas for plows. They worked in lumbering, at gift shops and in bakeries. Many became taxi drivers, which happened a lot in Paris especially. Colonels would roll cigarettes at factories. Officers would become gardeners. Former actors would often be seen working as bartenders. You surely remember Three Comrades, a novel by Remarque which features this minor Russian emigrant character by the name of Count Orlov. He worked as a kellner, in other words, a waiter, a movie extra, and a professional dancing partner. Remark writes, every night he prayed to Our Lady of Kazan that he might get a job as a receiving clerk in a first-class hotel. And he was prone to weep when he got drunk. It was easier for those who spoke German. Some would join the labor force. Many strived to get jobs as taxi drivers, private tutors, bakers, salespeople and assistants. Others tried to make a living off translations. Real emigration makes it abundantly clear that every job is worthwhile. Honest work is always a good thing. Among other things, Berlin became the capital of Russian emigrant literature and its publishing industry. Between 1918 and 1924, more books were published here than in Moscow and Petrograd, amounting to over 2,000 titles. This included more than 100 Russian publishing houses, all completely different in terms of their political views. The main liberal newspaper was called Rule. This was the brainchild of Vladimir Nabokov Sr., Vladimir Nabokov's father, who led the Constitutional Democratic Party. Rule's main purpose was to heal the rift between party members and unite them. Rule was printed with the support of a German publishing house called Ulstein. Both Ulstein and the newspaper's headquarters were situated here at Kostrasse. Publishing books and newspapers in Russia was a profitable business, not least thanks to a huge audience of readers all across Germany and Europe in general. Every party had its own newspaper. Some of them only existed for a day, week or month. Others went on longer. Rul was probably one of the most significant publications. At first, in the early 1920s, Rule was even profitable with a circulation of up to 20,000 copies. Over the years, Bunin, Sasha Chorny, and Tefi were published there. It was also the first newspaper to print the works of Vladimir Nabokov Jr., under the pen name Vlad Sirin. Rule's rival on the other side was Nakanune, a newspaper partly funded by Soviet money. It was a Soviet propaganda mouthpiece, much like today's RT. By the way, it was the only newspaper allowed to be brought into Soviet Russia. The works of Bulgakov, Yesenin, Zoshenka, and others were printed in Nakune. One of this newspaper's main publishers and ideologists was someone who didn't really stay an immigrant for long. The story of this man is very telling on the one hand, and quite unusual on the other. His name was Alexei Tolstoy. I want to share his story in detail. It still remains unclear whether Alexei Tolstoy was related to Leo Tolstoy or not. 
The thing is, his mother, Alexandra, while already pregnant, was married to Count Nikolai Tolstoy, who was Leo Tolstoy's third cousin. But before her son was born, Alexandra left her husband for chairman of the county land administration, Alexei Bostrom. Thus, many biographers believe that Bostrom was Alexei Tolstoy's real father. In that case, he didn't have anything to do with either the Count title or Leo Tolstoy. I'd like to dismantle the myth behind his origin. When we were kids, my dad explained the matter to us. Why is Alexei Tolstoy not Bostrom's son? Mendel's laws are at play here. The laws of genetics. Two blue-eyed parents can't produce a brown-eyed child. Both Bostrom and Alexandra Turgeneva had blue eyes, while Alexei Tolstoy was brown-eyed. There was no way the pigment could appear out of nowhere. It isn't genetically possible. Then in an archive we found indirect, but nonetheless psychologically interesting confirmation. Having left her husband, Count Tolstoy, Alexandra Leontievna wrote this to her beloved Bostron. I am leaving for you with this little bastard under my heart. If a woman has any doubts, she will never say such a thing to her lover. The bastard came from the Tolstoy family. However, Alexei Nikolaevich Tolstoy had ambitions, the range of which aligned with those of a true Tolstoy. Later, he would be sarcastically dubbed the Red Count. And you're about to find out why. When World War I broke out, Tolstoy went to the front lines as a correspondent for Ruski Vedemisti. There, he wrote a few plays and articles. By the start of the revolution, he was already a famous writer. True to his surname, Tolstoy didn't recognize either the revolution or the Bolsheviks. Later, he would write, During the Great War of the Whites and the Reds, I was on the white side. I physically hated the Bolsheviks and considered them to be devastators of the Russian state and the reason for all the troubles. In 1919, Tolstoy and his third wife, he had a total of four wives, well, he was full of love. Natalia Krandievskaya left Russia. First, they went to Constantinople like everyone else, and then traveled to Paris. It is there that Tolstoy wrote his first novel, Sisters, from his The Road to Calvary trilogy. In 1921, he left Paris for Berlin. In a letter to his friend Bunin, Tolstoy wrote that Berlin was a calm place and the Germans worked really well, that the Bolsheviks threat would never reach Berlin and that he felt at peace here. Berlin was enticing because it was the capital of everything, the art world, the literary world, the theater world, entrepreneurship and so on. A huge number of magazines and newspapers were being published in Berlin and the paychecks were very hefty. His social circle was there and that's why he moved. How was he doing in Berlin financially? Amazing. He didn't return to Soviet Russia because he was struggling financially and wanted to have his comfortable life back. Instead, he exchanged one wealthy lifestyle for another prosperous one. He was publishing one book after another. He was a famous and relevant author who gave speeches and received accolades. It wasn't a material choice for him, but a much harder one. Bunin, in turn, wrote that many laughed at Tolstoy in emigration, dismissively calling him Alyoshka, or Alyosha, in a more condescending manner. In general, everybody liked him because he was funny and interesting company, and had a knack for storytelling. According to Bunin, he was also a cynic admirable in his candidness, and gifted with a great and sharp mind. At the same time, he would often pretend to be a goofy and blithe ne'er-do-well. He was also a clever leech. A leech, now forgotten word, is someone who tries to profit from every situation. There are numerous recollections of Tolstoy's tendencies to act like Ostep Bender. For example, when he was leaving Odessa on his 
immigrant journey, he had to travel by a steamboat in third class, just like many others. But as soon as the captain found out Tolstoy was aboard, he, being a foreigner, assumed that it was Leo Tolstoy, the author of War and Peace. Alexei Tolstoy didn't try to change his mind and said, yes, I did that. I wrote War and Peace. He then moved into a first-class cabin and continued his travels in comfort. Later, when Tolstoy was in Europe, as legend has it, he sold his Russian estate to a local merchant. Needless to say, he never had one. I'm sure he did so on numerous occasions. Many remember him selling random things. He once sold some teapots to ten people. He was much like Nevzorov from his own book. He was Baratino. He was Alice the Fox and Basilio the Cat, Carabas Barabas and Duramar. He could be everyone, because he was multifaceted. Do you mean Nevzorov as in his character? Of course. Not the Nevzorov we know today, might I add. He might have been able to become today's Nevzorov. But such a mask, such a position, as well as idiosyncrasies, would have been alien to him. He loved life a lot. That's how actor-like he was, which explains why he had no trouble sparking a conversation at a table, or why his guests and women found him charming. As Bunin recollected, Tolstoy was leading an idle life in immigration. He liked to be a guest, especially at rich people's houses. Don't forget that everyone was strapped for money back then. At the same time, in a letter to his friend, the writer Corne Tchaikovsky, who lived in the USSR, Tolstoy wrote, Emigration bored me to death. I don't know if you're able to feel quite so overwhelmingly what a homeland means or what it's like to have the sun shine a familiar light on your rooftop. That marked the beginning of Alexei Tolstoy's return to the Soviet Union. An important step in that direction was made through his cooperation with Maxim Gorky, another writer who lived in Berlin at the time. Tolstoy also found himself interested in the Smenovechovsky ideology, which was a movement that united those emigrants who in fact recognized the Soviet regime. Tolstoy's works were printed in Nakanune, a Smenovechovsky newspaper. He was even hired as an editor of the newspaper's literary supplement. It was almost common knowledge that the newspaper was being funded by the state political directorate. Nakanun was sold in the streets of Moscow and Petrograd. This partnership caused some friction for Tolstoy in emigration. It came as no surprise because not many emigrants supported that ideology. In April 1922, Tolstoy received a letter from Nikolai Tchaikovsky, not to be confused with Corne Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky was a famous revolutionary and the founder of the popular Socialist Party. He emigrated after the Bolsheviks had taken over. In the letter, he unequivocally demanded that Tolstoy explain himself. Or, in modern terms, he asked Tolstoy Tolstoy why he was repping Nakanuni and the Bolsheviks. In reply to Tchaikovsky, Tolstoy wrote an open letter which said, even though I hate the Bolsheviks. My conscience tells me not to hide in the basement, but to go back to Russia and contribute something to our weather-worn Russian ship, even if just a nail, to follow in Peter the Great's footsteps. In fact, this was an open letter. It wasn't addressed to Tchaikovsky, but to the Soviet government, which Tolstoy asked to allow him to return. His request was approved. In 1923, Tolstoy, his wife and their sons went back to the USSR. My grandmother and his third wife, Natalia Vasilevna Krandevskaya, shared the following story. While still in Berlin, my five-year-old dad was at a metro station when he wondered, what's a snowdrift? Alexei Tolstoy then said, enough, my son doesn't know what a snowdrift is. We're going back to Russia. By the way, he wasn't going back on a whim, as one never did. He was returning under Leon Trotsky's personal guarantee. Where did he get his Soviet passport? I'm not sure he had a Soviet passport in his name when he was going back. There was no need. He brought the refugee documents that he had already had. As soon as he arrived, all the necessary documents were promptly issued. 
The Alexei Tolstoy Monument is located right in downtown Moscow. According to Kornei Chukovsky, upon his return to the USSR, Tolstoy immediately threw himself into work, leaving no time for break. He reset his biography and redeemed himself in the eyes of the Bolsheviks. There was a special term for it in the USSR, to disarm in the face of the party. Tolstoy disarmed, meaning that he started to glorify the Soviet regime. It culminated in 1933 when he once again boarded a steamboat, yet the travel itinerary was different this time. It was the infamous trip Soviet writers took down the White Sea Baltic Canal that was being built by prisoners of the Gulag. That trip resulted in the creation of a photo book called the IV Stalin White Sea Baltic Sea Canal on effective methods of personal rehabilitation. Scholzenizen would later comment on the book, saying that it was the first book in the history of world literature that glorified slavery. You see, everyone got involved in this mess. Everyone. Alexei Tolstoy liked to have a good night's sleep. I'm telling you this as someone with a similar set of genes. Had it bothered him, he would have gone insane. He couldn't stand being anxious. There was, however, something tragic about him. You can't love Russia this much without it being tragic. But it's not the sense of tragedy that doesn't let you sleep at night. It's the sense of drama, I guess. One can only sleep well if one believes that everything's done. It's all good. It's no big deal. It's just their job. Теперь один из лучших и один из самых популярных писателей земли советской. From then on, Tolstoy was dubbed the Red Count. He became a deputy of the Supreme Soviet, member of the Academy of Sciences and one of Stalin's favorite writers. Rumor had it that Tolstoy enjoyed a lavish lifestyle and lived large during those times of great trouble in the USSR. According to the memoirs of Anna Akhmatova, Tolstoy herself told her he would feast on caviar, smoked fish, cream, fruit, and some special cucumbers on a daily basis. Akhmatova noted that he did so while the country was facing hunger. This description is strikingly close to how Pyotr Konchalovsky depicted Tolstoy in his famous painting, a Sybarite of sorts, a lord of the manor with food and wine in great abundance, the Red Count. Yes, it was a sabbatic life. He was a very wealthy person. He frequented consignment shops. He would purchase Italian Renaissance paintings and beautiful furniture. He had exquisite taste. He was making a fortune off his literary works. But up until the mid-1930s, he'd been a trustworthy and diligent writer that could write just about anything and adjust his novels to suit the interests of the Soviet authorities. Having returned to the USSR, Tolstoy finished writing his magnum opus, The Road to Calvary. As you know, he started working on it back in Paris in 1918 and would only finish it in 1941. It's evident that the text and plot changed depending on the stance of the author towards the Soviet government. Tolstoy was awarded the Stalin Prize for this trilogy as well as for his novel, Peter the Great, in which he glorified competent yet violent individual authority. It's clear who it was really addressed to. When the Great Patriotic War broke out, Tolstoy got a job as the editor of the Krasnaya Zvezda magazine and stayed there throughout the war. He didn't live long enough to witness victory as he died from cancer in February 1945. He was posthumously awarded with his third Stalin Prize. This monument was erected here 12 years after his death. This specific location was chosen because Tolstoy lived just 100 meters away on Malaya Nikitskaya Street. His spacious flat is still there and it's literally a stone's throw away from the house of another writer who praised the Soviet authorities, Maxim Gorky. I covered his story in detail in our Walks Around Moscow episode that we did last summer. Check it out. You can easily guess how Tolstoy's success was taken by the emigres that stayed abroad. It was best put out into words by the emigrant poet Sasha Chorny in his poem written in Paris. On Wednesday, he called them butchers. On Thursday, he shined their boots, lured in by their regal with Nakanun in cahoots. Let me remind you that Nakanune was a Smenovechovsky newspaper that Tolstoy cooperated with. His service didn't go unnoticed. Account landowner and bourgeois squared, he is now published by Gossesdad.
Later, Tolstoy would travel abroad numerous times. He was allowed to do so by the government. Among other things, he tried to talk Ivan Bunin into following suit and returning to the Soviet Union. We'll get back to it soon. Actually, many emigrants that came to Germany and Berlin in particular got the impression that the things they'd gone through in Russia could happen in Germany too. A revolution, coup d'etat, etc. It was a time of great upheaval, and it wasn't clear which part the country would take after the fall of the monarchy. Another country that became a home for the Russian immigrants was Czechoslovakia, a state newly formed from the remains of Austria-Hungary in the aftermath of World War I, just like the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Czechoslovakia hosted up to 40,000 Russians. If Berlin's allure resided in its low cost of living, Prague was a good place to stay because here, the immigrants were quite literally compensated. The government of Czechoslovakia established special conditions, ones that would soon lead to Prague being called the Russian Oxford, with one reservation. In Oxford, you do have to pay a student fee. Here, the Russians were the ones being paid for coming and receiving academic qualifications. They were granted scholarships and rise to power. I can't say that the emigrants were living a lush life. However, they were given an opportunity to survive, get an education and a job. No one would have thought that the Bolsheviks would have such a long reign. That's why the Czechoslovakian government intentionally pursued a policy of emigrant selection. They tried to draw in certain groups. First of all, as they called it, progressive Russians, meaning the Russians that shared leftist democratic views. They hoped that this action would eventually be appreciated one way or another. And it wasn't that these people would go back to Russia and rise to power. However, they might have connections with those who would end up at the helm, thus fostering the development of economic relations between Czechoslovakia and future Russia. So in a way, was it an investment in their own future? Yes, both in their own future and in the development of future relations. So, in the early 1920s, the Russian Aid Action was launched in Prague. The Russian Aid Action was a state program in support of the Russian immigrants. It was financed directly from the state budget. And what money that was! 1924 was the peak of direct and indirect spending on Russian refugees with 83 million Czechoslovakian karunas provided to them. Today, the equivalent would equal approximately $38 million. No other European country spent this much money to help the Russian immigrants. Which begs the question, who was paying for that? In that regard, there is a big, beautiful theory which has been making rounds in many different publications for decades. Now, it's gained a solid footing online. The theory speculates that the Russian immigration was sponsored by Russian money, namely Kolchak's gold reserves. Have you heard of this? If you haven't, I will now explain it. To understand who is who in this scenario, we have to go back in time a few years to the Russian Civil War. In 1919, the Czech legionnaires established Legio Bank. Who were those legionnaires? They didn't have anything to do with sport. They were people who had been taken prisoner during World War I. They had mostly served in the Austria-Hungary army, of which both Czechia and Slovakia were part back in the day. They were taken captive, then the revolution broke out. After all the trials and tribulations, they joined the whites in Siberia and fought against the Reds. This was the famous Czechoslovak Legion. Then the White Army, which the Legion was part of and which would eventually come under Kolchak's control, seized some of the Russian Empire's gold reserves that were stored in Kazan. But only some of it, because the Bolsheviks had already managed to spend the rest. The Whites transported the remaining gold from Kazan to Omsk. 
It's worth noting that they were already losing ground to the Red Army. My father was supposed to be part of the armed escort in Saratov that oversaw the loading of the Imperial gold into those boxes and its subsequent transportation to Siberia. Did he tell you anything about what the gold looked like? He did. At first, he didn't know what those boxes were for. Someone told him, well, try lifting them. It's a gold reserve. And we're transporting it to Siberia, away from the Bolsheviks. We're talking about an insanely big sum of money. Today, it would equate to a few billion dollars in cash. When the Whites withdrew from Omsk in 1919, the gold reserve was loaded on the convoy. Together, the convoy, Alexander Kolchuk, the supreme ruler of Russia, and his command unit advanced eastward under the protection of the Czechoslovak Legion. The Allies insisted that the gold be transported to Vladivostok. But Kolchak refused. He said that he'd rather give the money to the Bolsheviks than let it escape Russia. To avoid a deep dive into the history of the Civil War, which we might do a separate video about someday, Kolchak was betrayed along the way and handed over to the Reds. He was arrested and shot while the gold convoy stayed under the protection of the Czech legionnaires as well as the Reds for some time. Eventually, the Czechs were presented with an agreement. We'll let you leave Russia, give you coal for trains and an opportunity to leave the country. In return, you give us the gold. That was exactly what happened. So most of the gold remained in Russia, at the Bolsheviks' disposal. 409 million gold rubles were returned to Kazan, Moscow and so on and spent on various needs by the Soviet authorities. Yet the remainder, because there was a huge difference, was sold. But part of it was sent to foreign banks as deposits or, or guarantees for loans and credit lines. Among other things, this money would later be donated to help Russian refugees. Of course, part of it was embezzled, as is often the case. So legend has it that part of that money was stored in Legio Bank. There have been many serious studies conducted about this gold convoy and Kolchak's gold. In general, esteemed historians have concurred that this story is fiction. The establishment of Legio Bank was indeed funded by the legionnaires' money, but it was their personal savings. The Czech legionnaires received money from the Triple Entente allies and by selling weapons and ammunition after the war ended. Yet Kolchak's campaign and saga are surely embodied in Legio Bank, and you can see it right now. You see this freeze. It depicts none other than the Czech legionnaires and their trying experience in Siberian's barren cold. An important thing to mention here is these huge amounts of money that Czechoslovakia allocated to helping the Russian emigrants really did have a Russian origin. Yet, it had nothing to do with the Czech legionnaires, but instead was connected with a certain Nadezhda Abrikosova. She was the wife of Karel Kremar, Czechoslovakia's prime minister. They are not talked about a lot around here, but I think that women play a key role in their families and in other regards. They can either lift us up or bring us down. So this Russian Masaryk aid action was spearheaded by the Russian wife of Prime Minister Kramar. She was the one who made Karel Kramar consider it. Of course, it's not talked about officially, but the context suggests just that. Czechoslovakia had just become an independent state. From a provincial Austro-Hungarian town, Prague transformed into a big city. There was an issue with accommodations, because the city wasn't designed to fit so many new people, especially Russian refugees. That's why at first they either lived in dorms provided by the Czechoslovakian government or tried to find an apartment, which was very hard. They would usually rent some tiny rooms on the outskirts or settle in villages just outside Prague. They were housed in Svobodarna and other places that weren't very comfortable, but at least they could study. When people have the privilege of attending school in normal circumstances, they don't appreciate it. 
So, the fact that they had to sacrifice so much to be able to go to school, they would borrow the handbook of anatomical charts from Czech students, because it was very expensive, and spend their nights copying the drawings page by page. After lectures and a lunch break, they would work on construction sites to avoid being dependent and relying solely on the scholarship provided by the government. Russian aid action, right? Right. My father recalled that even though they were tired, it was enough for them to sleep three hours a day. They would spend the rest of the day taking every opportunity. They had a bucket filled with cold water in the yard because they couldn't afford coffee. When they struggled to keep their eyes open, they'd stick their heads in the bucket of ice water and it was business as usual. Was he studying to become a doctor? Yes, in Charles University, the Faculty of Medicine. In the 1920s, the ancient Charles University, founded back in the 14th century, obviously this building was built much later, became a hotspot for Russian students and professors from all over Europe, thanks to the Russian aid action. The Russian Faculty of Law became one of Charles University's campuses. In 1922, its establishment was met with enthusiasm by the Russian emigrants in Europe and all Russian emigre publications. It was like, look, Russian students are going to get educated, become the best specialists, and work in the beautiful Russia of the future, where there will be no place for the Bolsheviks. This faculty graduated a total of about 400 specialists. You know what they studied very rigorously? The law of the Russian Empire and acts of law that had been in effect up till 1917, and other regulations of the already non-existent country. This gives a very clear idea about what hopes the Russian immigrants and Russians in exile were entertaining at the time, what they were waiting for, where they were going to return to, and what laws they'd abide by in this new Russia. Needless to say, this faculty's alumni struggled to find a job in their field. He got his diploma, but there was a reservation, because the doctors' union was afraid of the competition. So, they had to give a written guarantee that they wouldn't start a commercial medical practice in Czechoslovakia. Basically, a ban on work. A ban on paid work to avoid competition. Because the Czech students saw how rigorously the Russians were applying themselves to their studies. They were head and shoulders above their Czech classmates. And then he was visited by a delegation from a neighboring village. They said, our doctor is retiring, would you like to take over? My father told them, I can't, I don't have citizenship, so I have no right to be compensated for my work. Oh, don't worry, we'll settle this, because we have connections in the parliament through the Republican Party of Farmers and Peasants. We'll grant you citizenship, give you a no-interest loan. We'll do whatever it takes to have you here. So was it then he received citizenship? Yes, it was. Actually, all Russian immigrants, not only in Czechoslovakia but everywhere else, ended up in a legally challenging position. Why? Because the country whose citizens they used to be didn't exist anymore. Moreover, in 1921, the Bolsheviks issued a decree stipulating that everyone who failed to get a Soviet passport by June 1, 1922, would be stripped of their citizenship. Therefore, Russian emigrants abroad ended up being stateless. Apatride, which is the term for such people. And it was quite a predicament because everyone needed visas, resident permits, roofs over their heads that required such documents, doctors, schools, universities. Today, the same rules still apply. There were some serious measures taken on an international level to fix this problem. In 1921, the famous Norwegian polar explorer Fridtjof Nansen was appointed refugee commissioner at the League of Nations. A couple of things about this amazing person. He first came to prominence in 1893 during his expedition to the North Pole. The pole was considered to be an unreachable point at the time. Nansen, however, was going to reach it in an inconceivable way that many deemed crazy. His vessel entered an ice pack and drifted with the current towards the pole. His ship, Fram, drifted for one and a half years at the speed of about one and a half miles a day. 
as the direction of the drift was a bit off, at some point Nansen got off and headed to the North Pole wearing skis. He surely could have died in many ways during his trip, but it all came up roses. Except he didn't reach the pole after all, and was 400 kilometers short, as it was later discovered. It took place in 1896. The North Pole would stay uncharted for another 12 years. Another explorer would reach it eventually. So, after he fell short of his North Pole ambitions, Nansen decided to have a crack at politics. In 1921, he became the refugee commissioner at the League of Nations and introduced what was the most important project for the Russian emigrants, the project to grant them temporary proof of identity. It would soon be named after him and referred to as Nansen's passport. This is what they looked like. It's the latest reconstruction, so to say. We printed it ourselves. You can now find one in many different museums. In 1926, more than 30 countries agreed to recognize this document. For the majority of Russian refugees, Nansen's passport became their main document and proof of identity. What's interesting is, the Russians that settled in Prague would often dismiss it. Why? Because the conditions in Czechoslovakia were so good, given the circumstances, emigrants were given regular identification documents with no need for a Nansen's passport. Such documents were called prukazy. This is what they looked like. This is one in the name of a Russian emigrant, Sergei Stoyanov. Basically, this is like a modern resident permit. It bears stamps, signatures, and a photograph. It was called Resident Prukas. By the way, the Prukas was beneficial to those emigrants that traveled abroad as they would also get a foreign travel passport. If something happened abroad, a person who had a prukaz could contact the Czechoslovakian envoy in said country, meaning that this person had some kind of protection. 100 years ago, all the Russians in Prague knew this address. Panska 12, Hotel Palace was and still is located here. At the time, it was considered a very expensive one. But the Russian refugees didn't come here to check into a luxurious suite. They frequented the place because that's where all certificates and prukazy were issued and registration forms filled in. It was here that most of the money given out as financial aid to Russian emigrants by the Czechoslovakian government was distributed. Essentially, it was a cross between a multifunctional public services center and a consulate. The Prague Zimgor, the Committee of the Union of Zemstvos and the Union of Towns, was located here. It was the Committee on Aiding Russian Citizens Abroad of the Union of Zemstvos and Towns. It was founded in February 1921, if my memory serves me right. George Lavov, who was in emigration, became the chairman. He held the position up until his death in 1925. It occupied the offices on the first floor and in the basement. It's interesting that because the Czechoslovakian government allotted money mainly through the SRs and Zimgor, was generally controlled by the SRs, it displeased their ideological foes, the monarchists and constitutional democrats. It's only natural the ones who are in charge of financing always annoy those who aren't, or are, but to a lesser extent. It was for that reason that there was always some drama and petty quarrels surrounding Zemgor in the emigrant circles. Zemgor was blamed for engaging in financial speculation, for wasting money and giving it to those of the same ideological persuasion or who had just worked out a deal. It's the same old story. In that sense, the Russians took Russia to Prague. Russian emigrants would frequently communicate with each other. And according to Russian tradition, there were several groups that argued with each other a lot. That was common, and it still happens. So-called good Russians quarrel with other good Russians. Nothing new.
One of the major differences between the first wave of white immigration and all the subsequent ones, including the current one, was that it was the closest to creating a real state in exile. That is, creating all the institutions of statehood. That's because these emigres had political parties. They had monarchists, the Socialist Revolutionary Party, and cadets. They were leading a political fight with each other. It has some distinct structures like committees, zemstvos, and communities. None of the following waves of Russian emigration got close to anything like this. And the reason is obvious. Those white emigres left Russia in the early 20th century from Tsarist Russia. They also had experience in public politics under their belts. Those who later emigrated from the USSR didn't have anything like that. In Berlin, in Grunde, the representatives of the old state and the diplomatic elite before 1917 arrived in Berlin. For example, Alexander Kerensky lived in Berlin for a while. He led the Russian provisional government. The whole political spectrum of old Russia gathered here. This is the Russian embassy in Berlin. Now it's all surrounded with Ukrainian flags. The Soviet embassy used to occupy the same building, but it was built after World War II because everything was ruined on Unter den Linden during it. The old Russian embassy was in the same place. As you know, after the October Revolution, not all European countries recognized the Bolshevik government and later the Soviet Union right away. A lot of them took a while, even decades to do that. But as we remember, Germany had special circumstances. That's because after signing the humiliating Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I, Germany had to cede some of its territories. It also had to reduce its army significantly, pay reparations, and become an international outcast. Soviet Russia was in the exact same situation after the revolution. So, the Weimar Republic recognized RSFSR. There was no USSR back then. In 1922, it was one of the first ones. For most emigres, the Soviet embassy was a point of hatred, a point of tension in Berlin. They scornfully called this place Sovdepia, just like all Soviet Russia. The main language of the Communist International was German. That's why the Russian emigrants who moved to Berlin were in an environment that was strongly pro-communist and pro-Soviet. Not only did the Bolsheviks target the white emigrants, but also right-wing extremists targeted liberal immigrants, constitutional democrats, cadets and Mensheviks. For example, there was an attack on Vladimir Nabokov's father, Vladimir Nabokov Sr. We are now in the Hallensee district in Berlin. It was one of Vladimir Nabokov's Berlin addresses. He had 10 in total. And Nabokov, just like a lot of emigrants, didn't plan on moving to Berlin. His story was special. Initially, he lived in Berlin on and off because ever since his family left Russia, First, they went to London, and Nabokov studied at Cambridge University. Meanwhile, his father, Vladimir Dmitrievich, a well-known politician, tribune, and an outstanding man of his time, who created the cadet party before the revolution, an incredibly respected person, continued his activity in Berlin. That included opening a newspaper called Rule. They didn't rent the whole apartment though, and by no means was it their house. They immediately started renting out one or two rooms. It was due to their financial state. They were lucky to get good lodgers, but you can't say it was a luxurious apartment. No, it was a normal but good flat for one, two, three, for five people. 
It was Nabokov, his spouse and their three younger children. What's important is that Nabokov Sr. still had some money. He was rich before the revolution, and his wife was from a rich family. And they must have brought some money from Russia. Anyway, the family wasn't poor. But that all changed in the blink of an eye with a tragedy in March 1922. Nabokov Sr. came to listen to the speech of the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Provisional Government, Pavel Milyukov, here in Berlin. During that speech, Vladimir Nabokov was killed by two monarchists. But, in fact, it was a tragic accident. These monarchist terrorists were targeting Milyukov, not Nabokov. Milyukov stopped talking. When he went backstage, one of the criminals stood up and tried to shoot him, but missed. Nabokov and two or three other people rushed towards him to neutralize him. A melee started. At this moment, it all happened in one or two seconds. At this moment, a second criminal ran onto the stage and made an absolutely irrational and impulsive decision. He shot into the crowd as if trying to free his friend. He shot several times, two or three shots. A couple of people were injured, but it wasn't grave. Unfortunately, Vladimir Dmitrievich Nabokov was killed instantly. He could have died in one or two minutes, that's not important. What's important is that he died there, and very quickly. He was gone. Milyukov wasn't injured during the attack. This is the very tragic irony because Russian emigres criticized him a lot. For the mistake he made in 1917, for his words and deeds. That's because the search for those responsible for what happened always took place within the emigrant community during all the waves. But Nabokov Sr.'s situation was different. He was deeply respected in almost all the white emigre circles. And, after his death, several noted emigres wrote obituaries for him. Ivan Bunin and Alexander Kuprin were some of them. Here is Bunin's. An immense loss, yet another one. Oh God, when will Russia's miseries end? It is something that induces superstitious fear. Year after year, day after day, an unending chain of miseries and losses. Vladimir Nabokov Sr. is buried in the Berlin Tegel Cemetery. But, as it often happens in life, this tragedy impacted the history of Russian literature immensely. That's because Nabokov Jr. had to drop out of Cambridge and went to Berlin urgently, since he had to take care of his big family. Nabokov, the writer, didn't like Berlin. He was irritated by it. But soon we'll see that exactly due to this irritation and unwillingness to accept Berlin, we got his first prose masterpieces. Later, thanks to them, Nabokov became a great author that includes Mary, King, Queen and Knave, Laughter in the Dark and finally The Gift. He taught languages, he taught sport. It was chess, right? Chess, boxing and tennis. He really liked it too. But more than teaching, which Nabokov was forced to do, he loved literature, as well as the new art of cinema. He even got a job as a background actor in the Ufa studio in Berlin. There is a film called Chess Fever. We remember that Nabokov was fond of chess, and we can see him close up in this movie. There is no proof that it was really him, yet it looked like him. Take a look. What was the story about a broken engagement between Nabokov and Svetlana Sievert? Svetlana Suvert was one of his friend's cousins. He was 22 and she was 16. She was completely infatuated by him. He wasn't very well known, but he had already gotten some recognition as a poet, an outstanding, handsome and tall young man. 
He was slender and extremely well-rounded. No doubt she fell head over heels for him. It was going so well, what happened? Money happened, or rather the lack thereof. Nabokov didn't have it, while Sivat was from a rich family, and her parents wanted her further life to be wealthy and happy. That's why there was a saying that allegedly is attributable to Sivat's parents, we can't let Svetlana marry him, he's broke as a joke. Nabokov lived in Hollandsee, Berlin for 15 years. He became a famous author here. In this city, he met his future wife, Vera Slonim, with whom he would live all his life. Here, their only son, Dmitri, was born. However, Nabokov never came to like Berlin. As they say on the internet, he was toxic when talking about it. Later, he wrote that during all the time he lived there, he never befriended a single German, didn't read a single book or newspaper in German, and never felt uncomfortable not knowing the language. So he never gave Berlin a proper thank you for the stay or anything like this that modern polite emigrants like to write. As he said, his German was enough to say, Ich mochte etwas schinken. I would like some ham in the shop. That was it. What language did your family speak when you were in Czechoslovakia? Only Russian, of course. We even had a sign on the dining room door. It said, we only speak Russian in this house. When our Czech guests were trying to say something in Russian, we said, no, it doesn't apply to you. You aren't going to move to Russia, but we are waiting. Did your father say that he was going to return? Yes, of course. He continued to believe that all the time. It was a question of it just being a lost motherland. They realized this, but they didn't want to admit that they would never go back. They idealized this Russia. These thoughts were constant and tortured them until they died. I'd like to clarify something about the nostalgia and homesickness a lot of people mention in this episode. In 1927, Vladimir Nabokov wrote a poem called The Shooting in Berlin. Some nights, as soon as I lie down, I'm back in Russia, in my dream. My hands behind my back are bound. They're taking me to the ravine. Then he writes that he wakes up and realizes that he isn't in Russia. And then the rhythmic ticking sound calms down my benumbed mind. The fortunate exile I found around me is safely twined. And yet my heart would still desire to make it true, this Russian scene. The starry sky, a gunshot fired. White hackberries in the ravine. You might have heard these verses in Monetichka's song in a recent album. So I'd like to say something important about the difference between the first wave of the emigration and the rest of them. All emigrants are homesick. A lot was written about it. People talk and write about it now. It's obvious. But for the people from the first wave, the motherland isn't the place where they won't let you in. They will let you physically cross the border. It's not a place where you don't return because you might be arrested and put in jail because you don't agree with authorities. It literally means death to them. All these people are convinced that this returning to the motherland, which is physically possible, means immediate destruction. That's what Nabokov wrote about in his poem. These metaphysics penetrated the whole first Russian emigre wave. For the first time, it was really important for those people's understanding. And some people did return to the Soviet Union and confirmed that feeling by their fates. Some survived and even made a decent Soviet career. But it was a completely different life. In general and a metaphysical way, it was a life after death, a life from scratch, a life in a different Russia.
During the revolution, my grandparents fought in the White Army. But my grandmother would go to the Soviet side. She would spy on them to find out what was happening on the front line. Then she'd come back and give a report. She was a scout. So it was intelligence? Yes. Sounds cool. She'd give the White Army a report where the attacks would take place and stuff like that. And once she was living with my grandpa. I'm not sure where exactly. And my grandpa heard that she was talking in her sleep. After that, he forbade her to do these forays. He said, what if you don't come back? You will give something away at night and they'll kill you. Was he a White Army officer? Yes. How did he leave Russia when the White Army lost? His mother was German. Germans and half-Germans were allowed to go. Did they give him citizenship? No. They just let them live there at first. My grandpa worked as a taxi driver in Berlin and was studying at the same time. My grandma was also studying to get a Kaufmann diploma. It meant a salesperson with a high education. That's how it was. They lived in Berlin, didn't they? Yes. Were they poor or wealthy when they lived there? They were very poor at first. Then their financial status got better and better. Charlottenburg became the main quarter for the Russian emigres. Even nowadays, it's the main showcase of West Berlin. And it was like that back then. There was no West Berlin as such. It was just the Western part of Berlin. If you have ever observed how Russians lived abroad in the 2000s and 2010s, you definitely know that. For example, London, as one of the important places for Russian emigrants, was given the derogatory nickname Londongrad. It wasn't made up by modern Russians, because even Charlottenburg was named Charlottengrad. What's interesting is that only people on a wealthier side could live here, because the quarter was quite expensive. Why did Russians live here? This is another characteristic of the Russian emigration. People wanted to live in wealthier areas because they wanted to show their good sides. Besides, someone would also recommend this place to their friends, advise them to rent a flat here, and so on. But unlike Londongrad, the Charlottengrad people didn't spend the money they had earned or stolen in Russia as much as they tried to earn money, because they lacked money. That's why a bunch of Russian cafes, restaurants, bookstores, and banks appeared in Charlottenburg. It looks more like the modern Istanbul than London. They've got a lot of stuff like that there, too. Praga Platz, Prague Square, is one of the places you can call a part of Russian Berlin from a hundred years ago. But the thing is, if you try to locate these so-called Russian places and Russian Berlin from a hundred years ago, you'll in fact be hunting ghosts. You'll feel like you were searching for ghosts because due to the destruction of World War II, very few things obviously have survived. Praga Platz was one of the main squares, if we're talking about the Russian Berlin of the 1920s. That's because, first of all, it's the center of a district called Wilmersdorf, where a lot of Russian emigrants lived. That's where the famous Praga Dealer Café was located. There was even a verb to Prager deal. So people were sitting in Prager deal and drinking cognac. What mood were they in? You know, it's usually terrible. Let's keep three points in mind. Point one, a lot of people, pretty much 99%, left Russia unwillingly. That was point one. Point two, they had problems with the internet and with WhatsApp. Yeah. It just didn't exist. There was no coverage. There was no coverage. Nowadays you can basically do anything but maybe hug your relatives and shake your friends' hands. This problem was way greater for people back then, because people just left. 
Okay, you can get a letter every month or six months, but not always. And factor number three, it's less significant than the other two. Berlin was less attractive as a city back then. Was it? It was. It was boring. Just a plain, normal city. There were no attractions. The weather here is a little better than in Moscow. I'm telling you that as a former Muscovite. In any case, it's not like you particularly enjoy the local climate. We know this building as the professor's house. It was one of the first out of four building cooperatives which were built by the Russian refugees, partly with their own money, partly with money from the Czechoslovak government. They needed to solve the housing problem, at least for the older or elderly people. It's called the professor's house because most flats were occupied by professors from different educational institutions who migrated to Prague. Let me clarify. Building cooperatives were popular in Soviet times too. People invest their money. Yes, they took a two and a half million loan from a Czech bank, and it was taken under the Czechoslovak government's guarantee. I think the future residents invested just 100,000 korunas. Did they simply invest the money, or did they participate in the construction? The only one who physically participated was Professor Vladimir Alexandrovich Brandt. He was an architect who designed this house, and he lived in this house later. And did this house become one of the centers of the Russian immigration? No doubt about it. When everyone moved in, public life centered around this place. And a house church appeared here too, right? It appeared only in 1945, when the church on the old town square was closed down. The worship service there was led by Mikhail Vasnetsov, the son of the famous Viktor Vasnetsov, the painter of the Three Bogatirs and Alonishka. Mikhail miraculously evaded the Gulag and was the only Orthodox priest in Prague. But not everyone was as lucky. We'll talk about what happened to the Russian emigres after socialism came to Czechoslovakia later. My mum directed the choir in the Russian Orthodox Church. My grandpa and I when my voice changed, when I entered my teens, were bass singers. You and your grandpa were bass singers, right? Yes. We would be standing there and singing Kyrie Eleison and all that stuff. I have still got all the scores and the lyrics. You write music yourself, don't you? I do. Do you think there is some Russian influence in this music? There is. It's immense. Go on, please. My aunt was an opera singer. Grandpa played the Russian seven-string guitar. I still have it upstairs. He played humorous songs. It was simply amazing. What did a Russian emigre from a century ago, for example, from 1923, look like? When talking about an emigre, we shouldn't fall into the pitfall of generalization, because when we talk about the Russian emigration, we think about different famous names. Andrei Berli, Vladimir Nabokov, Maxim Gorky, Bunin, Marina Sveteva. But who said they were wealthy? On the contrary. No, they weren't. Besides, when approximately 300,000 former Russian Empire emigrants found themselves in Germany, they obviously were people from all strata of society. They definitely were individuals in a better financial situation. They looked better. They were people in a difficult position. We are still in Charlottenburg, on Gromenstrasse. I'll tell you why we're here. As you have understood, people who worked with language had it rough in the immigration. As it always happens, emigrants whose profession has to do with a different language have a hard time. In our case, it was Russian. It was so back then, and it's the same today. Undertakers had it easier. Here's a good example. Don Cossack Nikolai Peramonov, 
the son of a famous merchant Cossack. That's what they called those who were involved in trade and production. Yel Pidifor Peramonov. In the Russian Empire, the Peramonov family owned a great deal of grain storage, mills, mines, and steamships. They were basically billionaires, millionshiki as they said. But Nikolai was more interested in politics when he was young. He participated in student rallies. Then he joined the cadets party. Yel Pidifor tried to make his son stop all that nonsense. He gifted him several mines. It didn't help. After Yelpitifor's death in 1909, Nikolai tried to take up father's business, but didn't want to quit politics either. During the Civil War, he became the chief of Denikin's propaganda division. He established the headquarters for this division in his house in Rostov-on-Don. People say that as a businessman himself, he made such costly propaganda estimates that they fired him before long. Anyway, after the revolution, Nikolai Peramonov sailed to Constantinople on his own steamship and then arrived in Berlin. Obviously, here he had to start from scratch because all his money was left in Russia. Yet, Peramonov was able to bring something. He started to look for opportunities and invested everything he had brought into vacant lots in Berlin or into industrial areas, as they would call them now. They had garages, outbuildings, and old stables in such places. He bought these lots for next to nothing. Why? He realized that a new market was appearing before his eyes. The car market. He thought, if there are more and more cars, people will need car services tuning ateliers, and maintenance centeners. He saw that this niche was unoccupied. He took this opportunity and bingo. A local Steve Jobs. The business thrived. Money started flowing into his pocket. He opened some revenue houses and later took up publishing. Here in Charlottenburg, he opened one of the first pawn shops in Berlin. You could pawn your car if you really needed money. They still exist and are quite popular. In Russia, too. So the Paramanovs once again became one of the richest families, this time among the white Russian emigrants in Berlin. Among the Russians in Berlin, very few do not mention this place in their memoirs, letters, or books. This is the Berlin Zoo. It's not that Russian emigres were also keen on the lives of animals, it's just a big park in the city center with plenty of cafes. Russian emigres often came here to pass time and called this place a zoo garden. Here I have to tell you about Viktor Shklovsky a writer who commemorated this place in the title of his famous novel, Zoo, or Letters Not About Love. Shklovsky was one of those emigres who couldn't be called white, as he was an SR, that is, a revolutionary. He was involved in the February Revolution in 1917. In the 1920s, he was even fighting in the Red Army against Wrangel. But in 1922, when they started arresting the SRs after the Bolsheviks declared them enemies, Shklovsky fled from Russia first to Finland and then here to Germany. He stayed in Berlin for about a year. Here he was publishing Beseda magazine with Maxim Gorky and wrote the aforementioned novel. It was published in Berlin as well. This novel is written in the form of letters from a man to a woman he loves very much. She doesn't love him at all and answers him once in a blue moon, which proves that she has no feelings for him. Of course, this is a true story from the life of Sklovsky himself. His unrequited love's name was Elsa Triolet. She was a sister of Lilia Brick, Mayakovsky's muse, who he shared with her husband, Osip Brick. You must know this story. So Triolet went and got married to French officer André Triolet and went to France with him. Then the officer disappeared, but she kept his fancy name. She lived in London and later moved here to Berlin. Here's the amazing thing. 
Shkolovsky dedicated this book about his love to Triolet to, who do you think? His wife. Yes, he was married to Vasilisa Shkolovskaya, an artist. Yet she wasn't here with him, she was in Russia. She was arrested in Russia during the Civil War and kept there as a hostage. It was an established practice among the Reds as well. She ended up in prison and spent almost a year there. Lilia Yurivna Brick often sent her packages. She was her savior and helped her to survive. And since there were no charges against her personally and Shklovsky fell off the radar after a while, they released her on bail. She was released on a bail of 200 rubles, yet she stayed in Russia. Apart from his yearning for Elsa in Zoo or letters not about love, Shklovsky wrote a lot about homesickness. He wrote that emigration is a dead end. We are emigrants. No, not emigrants. We were itinerant. And now we are convicts. Russian Berlin isn't going anywhere. It has no destiny. Later, we will return to Shkolovsky's gloomy and pessimistic view of Berlin and German society of that era. But first, let me tell you about how his book ends. The author submits a request to the RSFSR government to take him back. I cannot live in Berlin. With all my habits and my skills, I am tied to the Russia of today. The Berlin anguish is bitter like carbide dust. Let me back into Russia with my plain luggage. Six shirts, three are with me, three are in laundry. Yellow boots waxed black by mistake. And old blue pants with a crease I've been trying to fix up in vain. Skolovsky's friends, Gorky and Mayakovsky, were making arrangements for him. And after a year and a half of their troubles, the Soviet authorities let him come back. In September 1923, he was one of the few, and indeed one of the first, Russian emigres of that wave to return to the USSR. But even here in Moscow, Shklovsky was lonesome. He wrote this. My life is as dim as if seen through a condom. I can't work in Moscow. At night, I have guilty dreams. I don't know about you, but this kind of duality really resonates with me. At first, you want one thing and strive for it with all your heart, like Shklovsky strove to get to Russia. But when you get it, you begin to miss what you've lost. You feel like you've betrayed those who stayed there. But we can't deny that Shklovsky had a very eventful life in Moscow. He became one of the leaders of the Left Front of the Arts Association, founded by futurists after the revolution. He wrote scripts for Soviet silent movies that were very popular, like The House on Trubnaya and Bed and Sofa. Speaking of bed and sofa, even by later Soviet and today's Puritan standards, this film is absolutely outrageous. The plot is as follows. The protagonist is visited by his wartime friend in Moscow. The protagonist's wife becomes smitten with his friend and doesn't hide it. They talk it over and decide to live together. Soon this wife, Ludmilla, gets pregnant and they can't tell which of them is the father. Shklovsky said that he came across this story in the Komsomolskaya Pravda newspaper. There was an article about a young mother visited by two potential baby daddies at the hospital. They were all workers and members of the Komsomol. And they weren't jealous because they were new Soviet people. How do you like that? By the Hamburg score, so to say. The Hamburg score is an expression that entered the vernacular thanks to Shklovsky. In 1924, he published a book titled The Hamburg Score. One day at dinner, Shklovsky was told about a closed wrestling match in Hamburg held without any audience. The wrestlers there would fight for real and see who is actually the best. Because in all the other tournaments, they would fight according to a contract and the outcome was predetermined. So this expression, by the Hamburg score, entered the Russian language meaning, by the most objective judgment. Our family lived cautiously. What I mean is, 
When meeting a new person, I would decide if they were friend or foe, and based on that, I'd choose how to behave. But no one had ever taught me that. I just saw how my mother and aunt were treating that person and acted accordingly. So, we lived, peeking out over the sheets. In 1933, Shklovsky was part of a group of writers sent to the White Sea Canal. Unlike some others, he had a personal interest in going there. He wanted to help his exiled brother, Vladimir, who had been arrested for protesting against the confiscation of church property and had been sent to the White Sea Canal. There's a script of Shklovsky's conversation with an accompanying Czechist. The Czechist asked him how he was doing, and the story has it that Shklovsky said, like a live fox in a fur shop. Grandfather was always lacking in confidence, and he was never able to enjoy any peace of mind that he had complied fully with state orders. It was his habit to go against the grain, always, and he invariably spoke his mind and nobody expected anything else from him. And yet, Shklovsky wrote the lion's share of text for the book about the White Sea Canal by that team of authors. But it didn't help his brother. Vladimir was executed in 1937. Shklovsky himself survived the war by evacuating to Almaty. His son Nikita was killed at the front two months before victory. Our family did not hide its son and he died at the very end of the war, at the age of 21. My mother and brother suffered from their painful inability to lie. How? I could never understand that. Why can't you lie? If you have to, why not? There. Then Shklovsky safely returned to Moscow. In the 1950s, he was actively involved in the persecution of Boris Pasternak. Then he wrote a big book on film theory and scripts for TV shows, becoming a well-seasoned and renowned author. He lived to the age of 90 and died in 1984. It wasn't an emigre story at that point, but by the Hamburg score, it proves an important point, that if emigres, especially public figures, were given the opportunity to come back to the Soviet Union, they had to glorify and serve the Soviet regime. You couldn't just come back and stick to your former convictions. This wave of emigration was a terrible loss for the country, a terrible loss of talent, genius labor, human capital. When you think of everyone who departed on the philosopher's ship in 1921 to 1922, those prominent personalities in the development of Russian thought and philosophy, it was a terrible loss. In the 2000s, they put a memorial sign here on the Schmidt Embankment in St. Petersburg, stating that from here, from this very embankment in the autumn on 1922, people boarded a ship and left Russia never to return. Their deportation was enforced by Vladimir Ulyanov Lenin personally. Now we all know it as the Philosopher's Ships. This name appeared in the 90s, because there were indeed philosophers on that ship. There was Nikolai Lossky, Nikolai Berdyaev, Ivan Ilyin. But there weren't just philosophers. The entire ship contained Russia's deported intelligentsia. To be exact, there were at least two steamers that left from here, not one. One of them was called Oberbürgermeister Haken, the second one was Prussia, and they were both heading for Stettin. Then it was in Germany, now it is in Poland. There were more ships beyond those, some deported from Odessa and Batumi. 
And there were also trains which took the intelligentsia to Riga and Berlin. Dissent was what they couldn't stand, because they thought differently, spoke differently. There definitely weren't any conspirators amongst them. They weren't about to stage any coups. But their dissent rubbed the authorities the wrong way. We had an episode called Walks Around St. Petersburg. Make sure to check it out. And there we were saying that Vladimir Lenin really didn't like the Russian intelligentsia, and he had to take revenge on them for not recognizing him as their spiritual leader. How did they compile the list of the future passengers for those philosopher ships? That's easy. By 1922, all press was under tight control. Most newspapers not operated by the Bolsheviks were closed, but there were still some newspapers that didn't focus on politics and didn't have to be loyal to the regime. For example, there was the Economist magazine, where they described what was happening in terms of economics, and Lenin pointed out the articles in that magazine and made a demand to Dzerzhinsky. On one of the pages, there was a list of editors. So he said, Felix Edmanovich, copy this whole list. These are the people to be deported. Lenin called them spies, molesters of working youth, and so on. Lenin was generally a bit too verbose. The other leader of the revolution, Leon Trotsky, on the contrary, was a talented speaker. He expressed himself in a clear and concise manner. He explained it in this way. We deported those people because there was no reason to execute them. But there was no way to keep them in Russia. And in hindsight, we could say they were lucky. Because very soon the Soviet regime had no problem finding a reason for execution. In total, about 200 people were deported. The operation began in August. By then, the lists of those to be arrested had been compiled. First, they arrested them all and engaged them in very sentimental conversation, getting them to consent to being deported abroad. Mind you, most of them had to go at their own expense. A question pops up. How do you send people to another country, say Germany, without a visa? Well, the Bolsheviks took care of it. They requested that Germany issue visas to the people listed for deportation. Germany responded by Chancellor Wirth, refused saying that Germany is not Siberia and you can't exile people there. If those people want to come here, let them request the visas themselves. We'll see what we can do. Mikhail Osorgin, a writer who was also deported, said that they were all informed that it was their responsibility to get visas and take care of the documents. If you don't do it, you'll go to prison. Osorgin wrote, of course, we took care of it. In the end, everybody got their visas and safely left for Germany. They came to Germany and settled there. But for many, Germany became kind of a transit point. In the early 1920s, another Russian emigre came to Berlin. His name was Alexander Zubkov, and he was a bit over 20. At first, nobody really knew him in the emigre community. But very soon, Zubkov moved here, to Bonn, and lived in the Palais Schoenberg. Here it is, behind a fence. It houses one of the federal chancellor's residences now, so we can't get any closer. So, how did this unassuming young man from the emigre community pull it off? Alexandru is probably the most famous representative of the Zubkov merchant dynasty. His branch of the Zubkovs took the revolution rather enthusiastically, understanding its historical inevitability. And they accepted the revolution, even though it made them lose all their property and possessions, they had to live at the expense of Alexander's father, Anatoly, who at the time was already working at a university, so they lived on his salary. In 1921, Alexander left Moscow for Sweden. It was his mother's homeland, so he easily got permission under the pretext that he was needed there to help manage the family estate. In fact, nobody in Sweden needed Russian emigre Zubkov's help with the family estate. 
In fact, nobody in Sweden needed Russian emigre Zubkov's help with the family estate. This large family had people who managed it without him just fine. Besides, this young man was rumored to be a playboy and a knucklehead. He had a talent for getting into stupid and scandalous situations, associated usually with women or alcohol or even drugs. From descriptions of him, we can make the following image. I'll be listing the characteristics I believe he had, and you say yes or no. Okay, he was handsome. Yes. Adventurer? Yes. Gigolo and Don Juan? He was a ladies' man for sure. At first he came to his Swedish aunt in Uppsala, Sweden, and so to say was trying to manage the estate. There he tried to star in films. He was also considered to look like Rudolf Valentino, so he served as his body double in some dangerous scenes because he could ride a horse and was physically fit. So he was a stuntman? We could say he was a stuntman, so he stood in for him on the set. Who is Rudolf Valentino? He's an Italian-born American actor, a hottie, and one of the first sex symbols of silent movies. Even though his career only lasted six years, he was super popular, primarily with women, as you could guess. Among other films, he was in Rex Ingram's The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, where he played a young and careless reveler who cares for nothing but romance and fun. And the lightness of his being was interrupted by the World War. This part was similar to Valentino's own story. He was known to be a heartbreaker and one of the main lovers of Hollywood in the 20s. He had countless flings with popular actresses only to abandon them. Before cinema, Rudolph went through plenty of jobs. At some point, he was even a gigolo dating older women for money. So his understudy, Alexander Zubkov, decided to follow in the famous actor's footsteps. He came to Berlin and worked at a local dance hall. He had received a good education and was a well-cultured man. He danced well, he was physically fit and good-looking, so he worked at a dance hall with older ladies, pleasing them with alcohol and so on. So probably that's how he came up with the idea to get closer to Victoria. Who is Victoria of Prussia? She is the younger sister of the last German emperor, as they call him here, Kaiser Wilhelm II. As a result of the November Revolution after Germany's defeat in the First World War, he abdicated the throne. He was exiled in Holland and lived there in the small town of Dorn. Mind you, the government of the Weimar Republic allowed him to take 23 train cars of furniture, 27 containers of personal effects, and a private car. So, technically, it was no longer a ruling dynasty, but in comparison with the fate of the Romanovs in Russia, we could say that Wilhelm got off quite easy. So, the Russian emigre Alexander Zubkov met his younger sister, Princess Victoria, here in Bonn. Zubkov at the time was about 27, she was about 60. The official legend has it that he met some Russians who set their sights on Victoria's wealth and wanted to get closer to her through Alexander and profit off of it. We can't say for sure if Alexander was only after her money, but it can't be denied that he wanted to settle down and get a cushy spot for himself. Apparently, they arrived in Bonn, where Victoria lived, in the Schaumburg Palace. And they were introduced at some party. And then, as he says, they were left to spend the night at the palace. In his memoirs, Alexander says that he reckoned if she came to his bedroom, it would prove the success of his plans and guarantee his carefree future. He stayed with her, and they got married. It's easy to guess how much of a scandal it was. All the European royal houses boycotted their wedding, and Wilhelm II outright refused to consent to his sister's marriage. 
But Wilhelm didn't have his former authority, so Victoria simply didn't listen to him. On September 19, 1927, the couple got married in an Orthodox ceremony because the Lutheran Church forbade this marriage at the request of the former Kaiser. Also, Victoria converted to Orthodoxy and took her husband's last name. His motivations are clear. What about hers? Memoirs mentioned that he looked like her first betrothed, a Bulgarian first prince she was engaged to, but never married. And again, if he was courting her, why not get some joy and pleasure at the ripe age of 60? Princess Victoria's first husband, Prince Adolf of Schomburg-Lippe, died in 1916. They didn't have any children, so the princess inherited the palace. That was where the newlyweds settled after the wedding. And the palace became a venue for endless festivities and parties. Alexander Zubkov didn't hold back, and in a few months, he frittered away all the fortune Victoria had left. She was forced into debt. When the time came to pay her debts, Victoria's relatives said they could pay her allowance, but to her only, so Alexander should disappear. Besides, the police said he had problems with his documents, as he did not have a visa or a residence permit. And Victoria arranged for him to move to Luxembourg, where her connections helped to get him all the necessary documents. So she would go to Luxembourg to visit him, and they had a long-distance marriage for some time. Zubkov stayed in Luxembourg, working as a simple waiter at a restaurant, but he was still enjoying perks from his kinship with the imperial family. For example, a sign at the restaurant entrance said, the Kaiser's brother-in-law is serving you here. Also, Alexander published his memoirs titled My Life, My Love. There he described in detail his relationship with his dear brother-in-law, Willy, that is the emperor who actually didn't want to have anything to do with him, to put it mildly. Also, he described his married life, yet without excessive sentiment. He honestly writes that it would be strange to say that he was head over heels for her, and in a sense it was very truthful and honest, but he also writes that he was grateful to her for the kindness she treated him with, and he paid her back with gratitude. Shortly before her death, Princess Victoria also published a book of memoirs and signed them as Victoria Zubkov, and her memoirs were very tender and sentimental. For example, here's what she wrote about Alexander. By a heavenly favor of providence, I was given a dear life partner, filling my life with new interests and dispelling the loneliness that often afflicts those of an old age who used to be in the center of life. This sentimental romance didn't last long. In 1929, Victoria caught pneumonia and died. She never divorced Alexander. She didn't want to get a divorce. It could have been a protest against her family and an attempt to establish herself, rather than her love for Alexander. Perhaps she held on to him more than he did to her. Alexander Zubkov outlived his wife by only five years. He was only 34 when he died of tuberculosis in Luxembourg. The newspapers wrote, Princess Victoria's husband dies in poverty. Maybe I'm justifying him, but I can really picture him as an evil, insidious, calculating and mercantile man. Rather, he seems like more of a goofball. Bender is also a cheerful man. He was a cheerful, light, adventurous person who didn't know money's worth, did not value money. Easy come, easy go. It came to him and he squandered it away. He had this rare optimism that is hard to come by when a person just likes to live and doesn't think they should build a career, leave behind trees, houses and children. They just want to live here and now. Living fast, so to say. In a good way. Although I think that he brought a lot of suffering to his mother, who probably had different expectations of him, and Victoria too might have expected a more stable married life. Poet Marina Tsvetaeva immigrated to her husband Sergei Efron in 1922. Their story went like this. She was 18 years old, it was before the revolution that she met 17-year-old Efron in the Crimea in Koktebel. And a year later, as soon as Efron turned 18, they got married. 
despite their very different backgrounds. Tsvetaeva's father was the founder of the Museum of Fine Arts, now the famous Pushkin Museum. As for Efron's parents, they were revolutionaries who lived most of their lives in exile abroad. After their wedding, Efron and Tsvetaeva settled here in Moscow, in this house in Boris Oglebsky Lane. And they had a daughter, Ariadna, and a few years later a second daughter, Irina. A monument to Marina Tsvetaeva was erected here not so long ago, right in front of the house where she lived. The first couple of years of their marriage were filled with bliss, but later they had some side flings. Before the revolution, they didn't have any financial difficulties or accommodation problems. It was all very good. When the civil war broke out, Efron joined the White Army. He took part in Denikin's Ice March and in the defense of the Crimea. With the remnants of the White Army, he went to Constantinople and ended up in that Gallipoli camp that I've already told you about. Tsvetaeva was then in Moscow. She didn't know her husband's whereabouts. She didn't know if he was alive. Here's what she wrote in her diary referring to her husband. If God performs this miracle and saves your life, I will walk after you like a dog. In the summer of 1921, Ilya Ehrenberg, a writer and friend of Tsvetaeva, brought her a letter from Sergei Efron from Prague. Efron came here under the Russian campaign of the Czechoslovak government that was providing generous financial assistance to Russian immigrants. He entered Charles University and his education was covered by the Czechoslovak government. Tsvetaeva found out that her husband was alive and studying at Charles University. She decided to take Ariadna and go to Europe, and they managed to leave in May 1922. I say managed because by then Soviet Russia had restored diplomatic relations with Germany. Besides, the new economic policy had been established, so it was easier to get permission to leave. Tsvetaeva used this opportunity and traveled to Berlin via Riga. On May 15, 1922, Marina Tsvetaeva and her daughter arrived at Berlin Charlottenburg station. The building looked different then, as it was severely damaged during the war. As Svetaeva later wrote, their luggage was made up of a chest with manuscripts, a suitcase and a garment bag, which was the last gift from Marina's father, the one who founded the Pushkin Museum. They had almost no clothes or shoes because everything had already been worn out. Unlike, let's say, Nabokov, Marina Svetaeva was obviously closer to Germany, as her mother was half German. So Marina had spoken German well since childhood. Germany had been with Sveta Eva since her childhood and was an integral part of her life. She loved Germany a lot. Where do I take a proper reason with eye for an eye and blood for blood? Germany, my sheer madness. Germany, my greatest love. Trotten Ostrasse 9. This used to be Elizabeth Schmidt's boarding house. Now there's a memorial plaque in Svetaeva's memory because it's in this boarding house Svetaeva's close friend Ilya Ehrenberg rented a room for her and her daughter. He had lived in this house before. Among the emigres, this boarding house was known as the house with balconies. There are indeed balconies, though not particularly outstanding, but they exist. Or as the Russian house in Wilmersdorf, Svetaeva's husband, Sergei Efron, came here to her from Prague. Here they finally reunited. After a while, Efron went back to Prague to wait for his family there. As for Svetaeva, she spent 11 weeks in Berlin, meeting and talking to her friends. For emigrants, it is often the case that when a new person arrives, at first, they can't get enough of everyone. Here's an interesting detail. This is where Tsvetaeva started her, let's say, virtual romance with Boris Pasternak, who was then in Russia. They started exchanging letters and kept it going for 13 years. Berlin was a good place for Tsvetaeva, because thanks to Ehrenberg, she published two collections of her poetry there, Separation and Poems for Bloch. Here I'd like to tell you about Ehrenberg. 
His story is very different from the other stories of Russian emigres because he wasn't an emigrant per se, although he was in Berlin, in Paris, and everybody seemed to know him. He backed the 1905 revolution. At the age of 16, he was elected to the editorial board of the Social Democratic Union newspaper. He was arrested for that, but was soon released under police supervision. Then he emigrated to Paris and lived in France for eight years. Then the First World War began and he worked as a correspondent for Russian newspapers Birzeveya Vidimosti and Utro Raisi on the Western Front, that is, for the Allies. Summer of 1917, the revolution broke out in Russia. Erdenberg came back. At first, he was against the Bolsheviks. But when they came to power, he switched his allegiance and got a Soviet passport. In March 1921, thanks to prominent party figure Nikolai Bukharin, who was Erdenberg's old friend, he received permission to travel abroad on a so-called artistic trip. And he moved to France again while keeping his Soviet passport and would go back to the USSR from time to time for his lectures. An incredible position. And again, he was incredibly lucky as being friends with Bukharin, who was later repressed, did not affect Ehrenberg in any way. In France, Ehrenberg was cooperating with the Soviet press and working for Soviet propaganda with such enthusiasm that he was deported from the country in 1921. But instead of going back to the USSR, he came to Berlin and lived here for three years. He wanted to make sort of a Michelin guide named after himself. And if somehow he had seen it through, perhaps he would have gone down in history in a totally different way. He wanted to make a guide for European cafes with reviews and photos by an experienced stranger. A contemporary look, don't you think? Roman Gull, an emigrant publicist, wrote about Erdenberg that he really loved the restaurant life. Rather, he liked to spend time and work in cafes, including the famous Prager Deal, where Russian emigrants were Prager dealing. He can live without coffee, but he can't live without cafes, wrote Gould. Ehrenberg himself wrote about emigrants as follows. I don't know why all these people live in Berlin. Is it the currency or visas? Are they emigrants or frugal tourists? Anyway, they are all unhappy with Berlin and don't miss a single opportunity to criticize it, especially Russians. Among them, it's considered good manners. In 1924, the left bloc came to power in his beloved France. So Ehrenberg was allowed to return to Paris, which he did. And there he was working in the news bureau of the Soviet newspaper Izvestia under the pen name of Paul Jocelyn. When I was thinking about Ehrenberg's biography, I thought it made a perfect parallel with Vladimir Posner. He was the Posner of his time. He was also a Francophile with a Soviet passport. He was also working for Soviet propaganda, but at the same time he had the opportunity to travel freely and work at international news bureaus. He was also on a first-name basis with everybody from the émigré community, but still stayed friends with the Soviet regime. An absolutely unique position. Svetaeva and her daughter, Ariadna, arrived in Prague in August 1922. They spent their first night here in this building in the outskirts of the city. At the time, it was a dormitory for Russian immigrants. The curious thing is that now there's also a dormitory for some local construction company. That's where Sergei Efron was taking shelter. Now the building has been rebuilt and repainted, but then it was one of the most famous settlements of Russian emigration. And in those times, this building was considered quite modern. There were even tiny rooms for one person. There wasn't any furniture, and they were separated from other rooms only by a small screen that didn't even reach the ceiling, so there was no soundproofing at all. The family of Tsvitaeva and Afron couldn't afford to rent an apartment in Prague, but living in this cramped dormitory with strangers behind the wall was unbearable for them. So they moved to the suburbs, and most of their Prague period, they spent moving from house to house in Czech villages. When their financial situation improved, 
in part thanks to the Russian campaign. Tsvetaeva rented an apartment in the city, and for about six months in 1923 to 1924, she and Efron lived in this house with a beautiful view all over Prague. Tsvetaeva was even visited here by Vladimir Nabokov, and he liked this apartment so much that he later rented it for his mother and sister. This house is number 109 on Loretta Square. Its story regarding Russian immigration began 100 years ago with the death of the academic Kondakov, who also lived in Prague as an immigrant in February 1925. The Kondakov circle of students and like-minded colleagues, including Sergei Efron, decided to continue his work. Kondakov at the time was one of the most prominent researchers of Byzantine and ancient Russian art in the world. When Kondakov died, his followers decided to continue his work and started holding seminars named after him, Seminarium Kondakovianum, as they called them in Latin. Let's talk more about Kondakov. We remember that he and Bunin lived in Odessa and took the same ship via Constantinople to emigrate. A whole cult developed around Kondakov later. What was all that about? At first he lived in Sofia, then Bunin left Sofia for Paris. Kondakov realized that somehow things weren't working out there in terms of research in his sphere. And then Masaryk sent him an invitation, which Kondakov accepted and moved here. And here Kondakov became a high-profile academic, partly because there were only two Russian academicians in Prague at the time. When Kondakov died, it was a huge problem for Efron, because the following day he had finals. He had to take an exam in some subject, and his professor had just died. So Svetaeva wrote to one of his professors to arrange for Efron to get his credits, despite Kondakov's death. Marina Tsvetaeva left a very vivid description of Kondakov's death. Kondakov died very quickly, saying, I am suffocating. Then he reconsidered and clarified, no, I'm dying. Tsvetaeva wrote, the last clarification of an academician who didn't tolerate sentiment in life. That's what Kondakov was like. Three years later, Tsvetaeva and Efron moved to France only to suffer more hardship which perhaps pushed Efron to serve as a Soviet intelligence agent. But we'll talk about that later. We need to say a couple of words about what white emigration meant to Soviet government. That's where it was first called white. The Bolsheviks were well aware that this was a kind of alternative external Russia, that there, that is, here, was the intellectual elite of the former nation. And they saw it as nothing but a threat and an enemy. Almost until the end of the regime, Soviet questionnaires would have the question, do you have relatives abroad? And one of the reasons for this question was white emigration. The Soviet secret services were also well aware that among emigres, especially among those whites who fought in the war, many wanted revenge and could form secret organizations to try and interfere in what was happening in the Soviet Union. And they came up with a truly clever plan. They themselves organized the white underground that would go down in history as the Trust. The Trust organized illegal crossings across the Soviet border for migrants, held secret meetings in Moscow and Leningrad, and helped distribute anti-Bolshevik leaflets. And in the eyes of most emigres, this was a real underground organization which got certain recognition and respect. And nobody knew that, in fact, it was Lubyanka behind it. As a result, with the help of the trust, the OGBU managed to exterminate a lot of real enemies who believed the legend about the underground network in Russia fighting the Bolsheviks, and came back to the USSR and died there. That's how they killed Boris Savinkov, one of the leaders of the Socialist Revolutionary Fighting Organization that used to fight Tsarist officials and later switched to the Bolsheviks. He was lured into the Soviet Union under the false pretext of a special operation called Syndicate 2. 
But the trust wasn't just luring enemies into the USSR and exterminating them there. The idea was much broader. It was also meant to carry out ideological work and show emigrants who allegedly arrived in the USSR illegally that life was good there and people were happy. So that those emigrants spread this idea when they went back abroad. Isn't that an impressive plan? And the most famous episode of this ideological struggle was Vasily Shulgin's trip to the USSR. This story alone is worth a whole movie. Shulgin is a well-known monarchist and writer, like many of them. He did not accept the revolution point blank. This is what he wrote about the February Revolution. Disgust flooded my soul, and it didn't leave me during the whole of the Great Russian Revolution. Personally, he didn't want the revolution. He wanted change. He wanted change through reform, if we can put it that way, but not through some shocks. But when the February Revolution broke out, he actually took an active part in it. He was elected to the Provisional Committee of the State Duma, and as a member of that committee in March 1917, he accepted the abdication of Nicholas II. He was present when Nicholas signed his renunciation. Later, he said that the monarchists had to be present as to not leave the sovereign alone to explain himself to the enemies. It was already clear that it was past the point of no return. Nothing could be taken back. And at the same time, we see that for many, it had become very convenient to blame all their own weaknesses on Shulgin. Look at this monarchist who forced the monarch to abdicate. But where were you? In 1917, we saw that not just monarchists, but leaders of the right-wing parties were renouncing their former views en masse. Purishkevich wrote the book Without a Visor, welcoming the provisional government. Lev Tikhomirov, who was given a Fabergé inkwell by Nicholas II for his book on monarchist statehood, was talking to his wife on the phone, and his wife exclaimed, congratulations on the coup. Tikhomirov himself, who was head of the largest monarchist newspaper, wrote in his diary that he was happy that the revolution took place. So, to some extent, almost everyone proved their weakness. In 1917, after the Bolsheviks' victory, Shulgin joined the White Movement. At some point, he was in Denikin's army. In 1920, he ended up in Constantinople and went to the Gallipoli camp. There, he tried to find his missing son, Vinny Ammon, who he lost during the defense of Crimea. Let's remember this detail. Shulgin then showed up in Czechoslovakia, then in Berlin, then he went to the state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs, and settled there in Sremsky Karlovci, where we've already been. In 1925, he was put in contact with the trust organization, which promised to help him find traces of his missing son inside Russia. He agreed. They made him a fake passport under the name of a foreign citizen, Edward Schmidt. And Shulgin illegally traveled to the Soviet Union. Someone still had to go to Soviet Russia. They say there's this powerful organization. It needs to be verified. It has to be an experienced person. It must be a broad-minded person. It must be a person with a fairly good intellect. And Shulgin was perfect for the role of an infiltrator. Let's be honest, that's who he was. His personal motivation was, of course, um, an attempt to find his son, and Shulgin decided to take the plunge. He visited Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev. Later, he wrote a whole book about it titled Three Capitals. If you haven't heard about it, I highly recommend it. It is full of everyday reality and details of Soviet life, which I find very interesting. Shulgin then safely returned to Europe. Later, when it was revealed that trust was an OGPU operation, for Shulgin, it came as an especially low blow, because his book had already come out. And it turned out that in order not to compromise the people who had allegedly helped him on that trip, 
He sent galley proofs of his book to those people who he believed to be members of the underground. And then he wrote these bitter words. And it turned out they were proofread by Jerzynski at Lubyanka. Jerzynski was long gone by then, but the story was one of a kind. Indeed, his book was edited at Lubyanka. It dented people's confidence in Shulgin. Um, he himself took it very badly. He wrote that this whole situation forced him to leave politics. He stayed in Yugoslavia and led a private life there for quite a long time. And when Yugoslavia was occupied by the Nazis, Shulgin stayed there, was very cautious, avoided any contact with German authorities, but didn't call to stand against them either. And, in 1944, when Soviet troops were approaching Yugoslavia, Shulgin decided to stay. When the Red Army got to Yugoslavia, he was arrested and sent via Hungary to Moscow, to Lubyanka, where, in 1947, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison for anti-Soviet activities. And he went to serve his term in Vladimir Central Prison. He was lucky to be sentenced to prison. Um, if they'd gotten him a little earlier, he would have been executed. But due to his poor nutrition there and his old age and, and poor health, he faced serious problems. Shulgin was in the Gulag when Stalin died. Three years later, in 1956, after 12 years in prison, he was released and stayed in Vladimir where he became quite famous. Shulgin was given an apartment. It was a one-room corner apartment. Of course, he didn't have a passport. Instead, he got a green ticket, a kind of residency permit. It stated there that he remained a citizen of the Russian Empire. If he wanted to go somewhere, he had to get permission from the authorities. And he had to register himself at a state office once a month as well. At the suggestion of the KGB, probably they were censored as well, a small book was published under the title Letters to Russian Emigrants. There, he honestly and openly wrote about the success of our country, that everything was fine, that he liked it there. And all of that was unbiased. But that wasn't the end of Vasily Shulgin's story. It had a fantastic sequel. In 1965, having survived everything, including the Soviet camps, Shulgin got to star in a film about himself. Shulgin played Vasily Shulgin, and the rest were actors because it was a feature film. It was called Facing the Judgment of History. In the film, Vasily Shulgin arrives in Leningrad on a TU-104 plane. It doesn't mention where he comes from, and he is met by the right Soviet historian, played by Sergei Svistunov. And together they walk around Leningrad, where Shulgin hasn't been for about 40 years. Which was true both in the plot and in life. And they are having talks of all kinds and discussing how the city has changed. But what's more important is that these two main characters are constantly engaged in a political discussion. Shulgin appears there as an awesome old man who has not lost faith in anything, who had not abandoned the ideals of his youth, who had not lost faith in the cause that he had served his whole life. They discuss the white movement, the civil war, the Tsar, the great patriotic war, fascism. Shulgin again totally outshines this Soviet historian, played by Svistunov, and looks really impressive. As for Svistunov's character, he looks like a, a stuck-up Soviet nerd. Yeah. 
чего она стоила нам, эта мирная тишина. Even by the standards of the Khrushchev thaw, when this film came out, I can't wrap my mind around how the censors allowed it, how they could even shoot something like this in the Soviet Union. In my opinion, this film is 100% anti-Soviet. Here's how it happened. There was a decorated Soviet director, Friedrich Ermler. Among other things, he made the milestone film The Turning Point in 1945. This film was a Palme d'Or winner at Cannes. But by the middle of the 1960s, he was an old man, forced to give way to the fresh youth. So Ermler wants to show that he's still a force to be reckoned with. So he comes up with this incredible story. He goes to the Central Committee's Department of Culture and reminds them about Shulgin, who is still in good health. He suggests bringing him to Leningrad and engaging in an ideological discussion with him to beat the whites at their own game. He sells this idea very beautifully, saying, I myself fought in the Civil War, and back then, people like Shulgin were put up against a wall. But now, after so many years, we have to beat them ideologically. Let's put the last nail in the White Guard's coffin. The Central Committee agrees to this, but, as I said, the effect is quite the opposite. Because Shulgin doesn't play the part, speaking in an absolutely sincere way. When the film came out in 1965, the Soviet government realized something was wrong, because it showed in theaters for three days before being removed. It wasn't banned outright, but it wasn't shown anywhere until the end of the Soviet regime. Ermler died shortly thereafter. It's just an amazing story because it shows how these people, the stars of the first emigration wave, so to say, how integral they were, how true they were to themselves, even after everything they had to go through, even after admitting their ideological defeat in the end. If you are interested in the history of Soviet power, the history of white emigration, I highly recommend this film to you, because it is a unique snapshot of the era. He might not be that interesting as a writer. Uh, he wasn't that lucky as a, a politician, but he was a witness. And that's interesting. He, he was a witness to a terrible age, a witness mm, to a cruel age. of 1920, things were going well in the Weimar Republic. The economic situation was improving, the unemployment rate was going down, incomes going up, production rates increasing. The National Socialist German Workers' Party, NSDAP, which grew popular during the crisis, was losing support. And in the 1928 parliamentary elections, it got only 2% of the vote. This period went down as the Golden Twenties, Golden Zwanziger. The newfound stability of day-to-day -day life allowed for the flourishing of art and science. And of course, that was the most liberal time in German history, a time of cabarets, bars, restaurants, ubiquitous alcohol, drugs, free sex, and all kinds of shows. Recently, there was a TV series by Tom Tickler, famous for directing Run Lola Run. This new series was called Babylon Berlin. If you haven't seen it and are interested in this period, check it out. They've done some meticulous work, lovingly recreating this atmosphere. And through this tobacco smoke, loud music and bright colors, 
Russian immigrants made their way, lived their lives. Skolovsky described it very nicely. 300,000 Russians of different ethnicities are roaming around through the cracks of a dying city, music in cafes, a nation of waiters and singers within the nation of the defeated. Sklovsky was very critical of Berlin's depravity. And we will remember that by the 1930s, he had already left for the Soviet Union. In 1929, the Golden Twenties ended. The country faced a new shock. The Great Depression is wreaking havoc across America. And like a house of cards, the European economies are collapsing one after another, exacerbating the global economic crisis, the biggest economic downturn in world history at the time. In 1930, all Prukases in Czechoslovakia were replaced by Nansen passports, despite the active protests of Russian immigrants. Because by 1930, here in Czechoslovakia, there were more important issues. Firstly, everyone came to realize that the Bolsheviks were there to stay. Secondly, the global financial crisis had reached Czechoslovakia, and the hopes and plans for a beautiful Russia of the future were put on the back burner. Millions of Germans were losing their jobs and sinking into poverty. And with the economic and political chaos, the radical Nazi party was gaining popularity again. And in 1933, it won the elections with over 40% of the vote in the Reichstag parliament. The party leader, Adolf Hitler, became Reichskanzler. It was totally legitimate, in full accordance with the Constitution. He became the leader of the country and literally the next day he began to tighten the screws. All opposition newspapers were banned, as well as public speeches against the Nazis. Mass arrests began and all parties were outlawed except for the Nazi party. Strikes were next in line. Tensions were mounting quickly. As far as movies are concerned, you probably remember Bob Fosse's great movie Cabaret with Liza Minnelli. That moment was shown there very dramatically. What happened to Russian immigrants during Hitler's rise to power? Some of them fled abroad, as well as part of the German intellectual elite. On January 3rd of 1919, God took me away from Lenin's totalitarianism to a free Germany. And on September 3rd of 1933, he took me from Hitler's totalitarianism to a free France. This is how the writer Roman Gould described the end of his German period of life. Interesting enough, not everyone left the country immediately. And not all Russians left at all, because many hoped that Hitler was a temporary thing, or because they considered themselves apolitical and thought they could wait it out in the city and keep their usual life working at their restaurant or shop. Needless to say, that proved to be just as fatal of a delusion as what was said about the Bolsheviks after they came to power, when many also thought that it wasn't for long and they could wait it out. Control over Russians who stayed in Berlin was intensified. Vasily Biskupsky, a general from Munich, was in charge of the Russian National Administration. Polarization was taking place. Most had left, but some remained staying in Berlin. Their exact numbers are known, between 10 and 40,000. Remember that successful Cossack businessman Perdomanov? At first, the rise of the Nazis to power did not affect his life. He was summoned to the Gestapo for a conversation. They asked him about his attitude toward Bolshevism, but in the end they let him go and press no charges against him. He had business there. No one really bothered him. El Pidifor, his son, studied at the German Polytechnic Institute, and they were doing just fine. They did not seem to welcome the Nazis very much. Paramanov didn't have much to do with them, and his son did not get German citizenship, so as not to be drafted into the army. And when things got tough, with shelling and so on, they fled to Karlsbad, Kalovivere, and then the Red Army came. 
потом пришла Красная Армия. Of course, they quickly realized there was nothing good for them there, and by hook or by crook, they started trying to get permission to travel to the American zone, that is, the German territory under control of American troops. It's hard to tell how they managed to get this permission and why they weren't arrested. Probably Smersh and the NKVD were busy with other things then. Later, they said that Peramanov's wife managed to get permission through one of the Soviet commandants by promising to bring him a watch as a gift. In the end, they didn't fulfill their promise and did not return from the American zone. There, they settled in the Bavarian city of Bayreuth. Of course, once again, the Peramanovs had nothing left of their business and money. And 69-year-old Nikolai had to start from scratch again and went into publishing. He published books in Russian, with the permission of the American Occupation Administration, which were meant for displaced persons. There were a lot of former citizens of the Soviet Union who were in Germany then, having been kidnapped or sent there after a camp, and a lot of them were in camps in the American zone. Peramanov was publishing books for them. Only once did he have trouble with American authorities, when they confiscated his set of postcards of St. Nicholas, because religious propaganda was prohibited in the camps. Peramanov died of a heart attack in Bavaria at the age of 73. After his death, his son Elpidifor, named after his grandfather, left for the USA with his family because he was sure that Soviet invasion and the Third World War weren't that far off. For Vladimir Nabokov, the Nazis' rise to power was the last straw, and he began to urgently look for opportunities to leave the Germany that, as we remember, he deeply resented. One of the important signals for him was what happened to Ivan Bunin, who was taken off a train from Paris to Berlin by customs officers and put through several hours of humiliating questioning. It was an outrageous and pretty ugly situation. Also, Nabokov's wife Vera was Jewish. In 1933, she was dismissed from her work. Until 1933, Vera worked as a secretary for a company owned by Jews. They were forced to shut down due to various obvious reasons, such as financial troubles and physical assaults of its owners. In 1937, Nabokov left Germany. First, he headed for Belgium, and his wife at the time went to Prague, where Nabokov joined her. Together, they moved to France and stayed there for the next three years. France was about to become the center of the first wave of Russian immigration. How did Ivan Bunin take the news on his Nobel Prize here? What happened to his love story with Galina Kuznetsova, a woman who he invited to live with him and his wife as his muse? And what happened to Kuznetsova's archive that apparently contains a lot of curious things? Why is it now in the hands of a person who swore never to give it to Moscow? Why did they arrest the singer Nadezhda Plivetskaya and sentence her to 20 years in prison? Why were there so many princes slash taxi drivers in this city? How did white officers become the main workforce of giant car producers like Renault and Citroën? And what did those Russian emigrants look like in Paris? How did their language sound compared to modern Russian? What did they eat? What music did they listen to? What happened here after France was occupied by Nazis? How did Russian emigrants split after the summer of 1941 when Hitler invaded the USSR? And what happened in 1945 when Stalin promised to pardon all the white emigrants if they came back? Did any of them manage to win recognition in a new country? And how do their descendants live these days? What do they think of Russia and the current wave of immigration? See all of that in the third part of our mini-series on white immigration. The next episode will be all about France. Subscribe to our channel. We'll see you soon.